Hello everybody, this is Red Panther transmitting from my sacred temple of Eris in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Today, I'll be bringing you three books of occult philosophy, or of magic, written by that famous man, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, knight and doctor of both laws, counselor to Caesar's sacred majesty, and judge of the prerogative court. And to my knowledge, this was originally published in 1531. Well, it's one of the earliest compendiums of ceremonial magic. For the sake of ease of reading, I'm just going to skip the footnotes. This issue has been... Oh, fuck me. Fucking Skeeter's up in here. Um, this copy's been through several translators, so it does have some notes. It has several introductions. Um, but I'm gonna just skip over all that, and uh, here goes. Book 1, Chapter 1. How magicians collect virtues from the threefold world is declared in these three books. Seeing there is a threefold world, elementary, celestial, and intellectual, and every inferior is governed by its superior, and receiveth the influence of the virtues thereof, so that the very original and chief worker of all doth by angels, the heavens, stars, elements, plants, metals, and stones, convey from himself the virtues of his omnipotency upon us, for whose service he made and created all these things. Wise men conceive it no way irrational that it should be possible for us to ascend by the same degrees through each world to the same very original world itself, the maker of all things in first cause from whence all things are and proceed, and also to enjoy not only these virtues, which are already in the more excellent kind of things, but also besides these to draw new virtues from above. Hence it is that they seek after the virtues of the elementary world through the help of the physic and natural philosophy in the various mixtures of natural things, then of the celestial world in the rays, and influences thereof according to the rules of astrologers, and the doctrines of mathematicians joining the celestial virtues to the former. Moreover, they ratify and confirm all these with the powers of diverse intelligences through the sacred ceremonies of religion. The order and process of these I shall endeavor to deliver in these three books, whereof the first contains natural magic, the second celestial, and the third ceremonial. But I know not whether it be an unpardonable presumption in me that I, a man of so little judgment and learning, should in my very youth so confidently set upon a business so difficult, so hard and intricate as this. Wherefore, whatsoever things have here already, and shall afterwards be said by me, I would not have any one assent to them, nor shall I myself any further than they shall be approved by the universal church and the congregation of the faithful. All right, well, that was pretty short, so I'm going to go ahead and go to chapter two now, since i got about 15 minutes of runtime before my tape runs out. Chapter two. What magic is, what are the parts thereof, and how the professors thereof must be qualified. Magic is a faculty of wonderful virtue, full of most high mysteries, containing the most profound contemplation of most secret things, together with the nature, power, quality, substance, and virtues thereof, as also the knowledge of whole nature, and it doth instruct us concerning the differing and agreement of things amongst themselves, whence it produceth its wonderful effects, by uniting the virtues of things through the application of them one to the other, and to their inferior suitable subjects, joining and knitting them together thoroughly by the powers and virtues of the superior bodies. This is the most perfect and chief science, that sacred and sublimer kind of philosophy, and lastly, the most absolute perfection of all most excellent philosophy. For seeing that all regulative philosophy is divided into natural, mathematical, and theological, natural philosophy teacheth the nature of those things which are in the world, searching and inquiring into their causes, effects, times, places, fashions, events, their whole and parts also. The number and nature of those things, called elements, what fire, earth, air forth brings, from whence the heavens their beginnings had, whence tide, whence rainbow and gay colors clad, what makes the clouds that gathered are in black, to send forth lightnings in a thundering crack, what doth the nightly flames and comets make, what makes the earth to swell and then to quake? What is the seed of metals and of gold? What virtue's wealth doth nature's coffer hold? All these things doth natural philosophy, 
the viewer of nature contain, teaching us to Virgil's muse. Whence all things flow, whence mankind beast, whence fire, whence rain and snow. Whence earthquakes are, why the whole ocean beats over his banks and then again retreats. Whence strength of herbs, whence courage, rage of brutes, all kinds of stone of creeping things and fruits. But mathematical philosophy teacheth us to know the quantity of natural bodies, as extended into three dimensions, as also to conceive of the motion and course of celestial bodies. As in great haste, what makes the golden stars to march so fast? What makes the moon sometimes to mask her face? The sun also, as if in some disgrace. And as Virgil sings, How the sun doth rule with twelve zodiac signs, the orb that's measured round about with lines, it doth the heaven's starry way make known, and strange eclipses of the sun and moon, Arcturus also in the stars of rain, the seven stars likewise in Charles his wane. Why winter suns make towards the west so fast? What makes the nights so long ere they be past? All which is understood by mathematical philosophy. Hence by the heavens we may foreknow the seasons all times for to reap and sow, and when tis fit to launch into the deep, and when to war, and when in peace to sleep, and when to dig up trees, and them again to set, so that they may bring forth a main. Now theological philosophy, or divinity, teacheth what God is, what the mind, what an intelligence, what an angel, what a devil, what the soul, what religion, what sacred institutions, rites, temples, observations, and sacred mysteries are. It instructs us also concerning faith, miracles, the virtue of words and figures, the secret operations and mysteries of seals, and, as Apuleius saith, it teaches us rightly to understand, and to be skilled in the ceremonial laws, the equity of holy things and rule of religions. But to recollect myself, these three principal faculties magic comprehends, unites, and actuates. Deservedly, therefore, it was by the ancients esteemed as the highest and most sacred philosophy. It was, as we find, brought to light by most sage authors and most famous writers, among which principally Zamolxis and Zoroaster were so famous that many believed they were the inventors of this science. Their track Aberus the Hyperborean, Charmondas Damageron, Eudoxus Hermippus followed. There were also eminent choice men as Mercurius Trismegistus, Porphyrius, Iamblichus, Plotinus, Proclus, Dardanus, Orpheus the Thracian, Gog the Grecian, Germa the Babylonian, Apollonius of Tyana, Osthenes also wrote excellently in this art, whose books being as it were lost, Democritus of Abdera recovered and set forth with his own commentaries. Besides Pythagoras, Empedocles, Democritus, Plato, and many other renowned philosophers traveled far by sea to learn this art, and being returned, published it with wonderful devoutness, esteeming of it as a great secret. Also it is well known that Pythagoras and Plato went to the prophets of Memphis to learn it, and traveled through almost all Syria, Egypt, Judea, and the schools of the Chaldeans, that they might not be ignorant of the most sacred memorials and records of magic, as also that they might be furnished with divine things. Whosoever, therefore, is desirous to study in this faculty, if he be not skilled in natural philosophy, wherein are discovered the qualities of things, and in which are found the occult properties of every being, and if he be not skillful in the mathematics, in the aspects and figures of the stars, upon which depends the sublime virtue and property of everything, and if he be not learned in theology, wherein are manifested those immaterial substances which dispense and minister all things, he cannot be possibly able to understand the rationality of magic. For there is no work that is done by mere magic, nor any work that is merely magical, that doth not comprehend these three faculties. Chapter 3 of the four elements, their qualities, and mutual mixtures. There are four elements, and original grounds of all corporeal things, fire, earth, water, air, of which all elementated inferior bodies are compounded, not by way of heaping them up together, but by transmutation and union, 
And when they are destroyed, they are resolved into elements. For there is none of the sensible elements that is pure, but they are more or less mixed, and apt to be changed one into the other, even as earth becoming dirty and being dissolved becomes water, and the same being made thick and hard becomes earth again. But being evaporated through heat passeth into air, and that being kindled passeth into fire, and this being extinguished returns back again into air, but being cooled again after its burning becomes earth or stone or sulfur, and this is manifested by lightning. Plato also was of that opinion that earth was wholly changeable, and that the rest of the elements are changed as into this, so into one another successfully. But it is the opinion of the subtler sort of philosophers that earth is not change, but relented and mixed with other elements, which do not dissolve it, and that it returns back into itself again. Now every one of the elements hath two special qualities, the former whereof it retains as proper to itself, and the other as a mean it agrees with that which comes next after it. For fire is hot and dry, earth dry and cold, the water cold and moist, the air moist and hot. And so after this manner the elements, according to two contrary qualities, are contrary to one the other, as water to fire and earth to air. Moreover, the elements are upon another account, opposite one to the other, for some are heavy, as earth and water, and others are light, as air and fire. Wherefore the Stoics called the former passives, but the latter actives. And yet, once again, Plato distinguishes them after another manner, and assigns to every one of them three qualities, to the fire, brightness, thinness, and motion, but to the earth, darkness, thickness, and quietness. And according to these qualities, the elements of fire and earth are contrary. But the other elements borrow their qualities from these, so that the air receives two qualities of the fire, thinness and motion, and one of the earth, darkness. In like manner, water receives two qualities of the earth, darkness and thickness, and one of fire, motion. But fire is twice more thin than air, thrice more movable, and four times more bright. And the air is twice more bright, thrice more thin, and four times more movable than water. Wherefore water is twice more bright than earth, thrice more thin, and four times more movable. As therefore the fire is to the air, so air to the water, and water to the earth. And again, as the earth is to the water, so the water is to the air, and the air to the fire. And this is the root and foundation of all bodies, natures, virtues, and wonderful works. And he which shall know these qualities of the elements and their mixtures shall easily bring to pass such things that are wonderful and astonishing, and shall be perfect in magic. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm running out of time here. Tune in soon for chapters 4, 5, and 6. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for listening. Good night.